Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. And as you're turning there, I want to share a little something with you. A husband and a wife were traveling on vacation. As they entered the state of Kentucky, a large debate started. The wife tells her husband, she says, I'm getting a little hungry. Let's stop in Louisville to get some lunch. The husband looked at her and said, well, that's not how you pronounce it. It's pronounced Louisville. This debate went on for miles. And once they reached the city, they went inside the restaurant for lunch. As the husband stopped to order, he asked the clerk, he says, look, can you help us settle this debate? Just speak slowly and tell us exactly where we are. The clerk leaned into the mic and he said, Burger King. And the debate continues. Amen. So this morning we are going to continue our study in the parables of Jesus. A little side note. We started last week, and we started in chapter 13. In chapter 13, we need to understand that this is the first time that Jesus actually spoke in parables. He didn't immediately begin his ministry by speaking in parables. He, he simply began using parables as a result of the events that happened in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus offered up the kingdom to his people, to the Jews. Offered up the kingdom, but they refused and accused him of having a devil instead. So Jesus plainly taught, he said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. So when they rejected his offer, he was not going to, to cast the pearls of truth and cast them or reveal them before those who didn't want truth. Now remember, a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual or heavenly meaning. We need to remember that the Bible is a spiritual book, right? The Bible is the Word of God, and God is spirit. So therefore, it's a spiritual book. It cannot be understood with human wisdom, with human understanding. It has to be revealed. It has to be unlocked by God's Holy Spirit if we truly want to know what it says. So this morning, let's pick up in Matthew chapter 13, skip down to verse 24. Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the hot time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So right off the bat, we see a couple things that were familiar with the first parable that we looked at uh, last week, uh, the parable of the, of the good soil, uh, the sower and the seed. And so the first thing that we see that's familiar is the sower. In verse 37, we see that the sower is identified. He who sows good seed is the son of man. So the Bible lets us know that the sower is the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ himself. And the second thing that we see that's familiar uh, is the seed. In verse 19, if we go back, for the hearts of the people have grown, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 19, therefore hear the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, so the seed is identified as the word of the kingdom, also known as the word of God, or the Bible, right? So the sower is Jesus Christ himself. The seed is the Bible. Is there anything wrong with the sower? He's perfect. Anything wrong with the seed? It's perfect. Amen? So keep that in mind. Nothing wrong with the sower, nothing wrong with the seed. Now let's pick up again in verse 25. It says, But while men slept, his enemy came 
and sowed tares among the wheat, and then went his way. So we see here that when the sower went out and he sowed good seed, uh, that seed produced wheat in his field. But we also see that there was something else growing among the wheat. It was tares. Now what are tares? Tares are also known as the Darnell seed. Some of you, are, if you're into agriculture, may know what the Darnell seed is. But the Darnell plant and the wheat plant, when they begin to grow, they look absolutely identical. You can't tell them apart. can't differentiate between the two. It's not until the wheat is fully grown that you can tell the difference. But then it's too late. There's another problem. Because the, 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 the roots of the tares are entangled with the, uh, the roots of the wheat. So if you try to pull out the tear, you end up also pulling up the root of the wheat as well. So that's the problem that they face. Let's skip down to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he went into his house, into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. So Jesus was teaching the multitude. The multitude went away, and he was by himself with the disciples. And the disciples come to him, and in typical fashion, in typical human nature, they focus on what? The bad. The negative. Right? They ask Jesus, tell us about the terrors. In reality, that field had both good and bad in it, didn't it? That field had both wheat and tares in it, but they wanted to focus on the negative. And that's true kind of about everyday life, isn't it? We have both good and bad all around us. But what do we tend to focus on? We tend to focus on the negative, don't we? We like to focus on the bad. You know, sometimes when, when you know, we have some of our church family missing and, and our attendance drops and it goes down, we always want to look at who's not here and who's missing. Why can't we focus on the ones that are here and be thankful and praise God for them? Amen? We need to look at both sides. Too often we ask, why is there evil in the world? We should be asking, why is there good in the world? Amen? Verse 36. Let's pick up. Jesus sent the multitude away, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather uh, out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we see Jesus' response to the disciples when they asked, and, uh, asked him to explain about the tares in the field. And I want us to concentrate this morning on Jesus' response. So the first thing that we see Jesus tell them, he tells them that it was the enemy that sowed the tares. Verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done this. And then in verse 39, he says, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So Jesus identifies the sower of the tares as their enemy, and then he identifies that enemy as Satan himself. So Satan, our enemy, is the one responsible for sowing these tares among the wheat. We need to understand that Satan is the great deceiver, and he's also the great imitator of holy God. Amen? Everything that God does, whatever God does, Satan tries to imitate. God has the Holy Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. During the time of the tribulation, during the end days, Satan will also try to imitate God. He himself will try to imitate God himself. 
He will raise up the Antichrist to imitate Jesus Christ, and he will also raise up a false prophet to imitate the Holy Spirit. This is what Satan does. He tries to imitate God as much as he can. And here we see that Jesus the sower, he sows this good seed in the field. Now this good, good seed springs up as good wheat. And he has identified that good wheat as the sons of God, the believers, the born-again believer. He's talking about the church. Amen? And the spiritual church, he's not talking about this building. The spiritual church is all born-again believers. That is the wheat that the sower sowed, and that was the crop that it uh, raised up, was a body of believers. Now we see here again, Satan tries to imitate Christ by sowing tares among that wheat. And those tares, we need to understand, are sown in the same place that the wheat sprouted. And where is that? Right here in church. Amen? Satan sowed those tares right inside of the church. So let's look a little closer here. What is the field that Satan sowed? He sowed that among the wheat. He sowed it right inside the church itself. Again, Satan realized that he could not defeat the church by attacking it from the outside. Satan has always uh, uh, declared war against God, against anything godly, against his word, and against his people. And he's tried to, he tried to, to, to defeat the church from the outside, realized he couldn't do it. When he persecuted the Christians, that only strengthened their faith. It only made them draw closer to God. So he reversed tactics, right? What did he do? Instead of attacking from the outside, Satan came inside the church and he decided to attack from the inside. And how did he do it? He sowed tares inside the church. He sowed tares among the wheat. Now question, how did the tares get in? Who let the tares in? Well, go back to verse 25. Jesus said, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. We, the body of believers, all born again believers, the church, we fell asleep at the wheel. Amen. That's how the tares got in. Too many have turned a blind eye to worldly things. They've let worldly theology. They've let worldly ideas creep into the church. They've let worldly traditions creep into the church. Ideas that are contrary to God, contrary to His Word. We see things like homosexuality creeping into the church. These are things contrary to the Word of God. Abortion and socialism, all these things are contrary to the Word of God, yet Christians have fallen asleep and allowed them to creep into the church. This is how tares were among the wheat. Tares. What are tares? Jesus identified them as sons of the enemy. They are counterfeit Christians. They're hypocrites. They're the ones that come into church with these worldly ideas, and they're the ones that are trying to cause division within the church body. Amen? Counterfeit Christians. Look back at verse 27. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Servants. Who are his servants? It's us, right? You and me. We are the servants of the sower. The, server is, the sower is Jesus Christ. We are his servants. What was our reaction when we found out there were tares among the wheat? When there were tears right inside the church, we were stunned, right? We were surprised. That's exactly, he said, wait a minute, you sowed good seed. How then does it have tears? They were surprised. We were surprised to find out. Was Jesus? Not at all. Amen. We were surprised, but Jesus was not. 
Jesus knew it would happen. And he warned us some 2,000 years ago that it was going to happen. Amen? Here's my point in all this that I want to make. Jesus knew that Satan was going to sow terrors inside his church. He knew that there would be counterfeit Christians. He knew that there would be false believers. He knew that there would be hypocrites in the church. He was not surprised, and he does not want us to be surprised either. Amen? He doesn't want us to get discouraged when we see that there's, that there's divisions in the church. He doesn't want us to get discouraged when we rub shoulders with hypocrites in the church. I just can't get along with that person and so and so. And these tears, all they're trying to do is tear the church from the inside out. They're trying to cause divisions from the inside out. Jesus wasn't surprised and we should not be surprised. He told us this 2,000 years ago. He gave us plenty of warning so that we would not get discouraged. We can't get discouraged when we see hypocrites in the church. Jesus said it was going to happen, and it has happened. Amen? Second point that Jesus made. Jesus also said, let them grow together. Verse 28. He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together. In our own experience, right? How many has ever grown a garden? Even a flower garden, right? Most of us. What do we do if we see a weed in our garden? We go pull it, right? We want to yank that baby out, grab it and get it by its roots and get it out of there. That is the natural response. That's the natural thing for us to do is to, is to pull them out. So isn't that what we should do in the church? When we find a tear in the church, isn't that what we should do? Well, that's what the flesh tells us to do, doesn't it? But there's a problem with that idea that Jesus tells us about here. First and foremost, the tares and the wheat, they look identical. Amen? They look identical. We cannot tell them apart. We cannot tell the difference between an immature, uh, uh, you know, a babe in Christ. We can't tell a babe in Christ apart from a tear. Amen? It's hard for us to tell a counterfeit Christian from a true believer at times. It's not up to us to figure that out. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. He's making it very clear that we are not to concern ourselves with what the other person is doing. Amen? Too often we put our nose where it doesn't belong. Too often we want to look at what the other person is doing and we want to be a critic and we want to criticize, oh, they did it this way or they did this that way, instead of worrying about what we are doing ourselves. We need to only be concerned. We need to only look in the mirror and say, what have I done for my Lord today? Amen? If we do that, listen, that's going to keep us busy all day long. We shouldn't have time to worry about what someone else is doing. Amen? We need to just worry about us. Stop wasting time and energy worrying about what others are doing. And we need to put that time and energy into serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus said, let them grow together. The third thing that Jesus said, not just let them grow together, but he said, let them grow together until when? The harvest. Until the harvest. Verse 30. Let them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, Bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skip down to verse 39. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Listen, we need to praise God that today seed 
is still being sown. Amen? That Jesus is still sowing seed, and we are to follow in His footsteps, and we are to be out there sowing that same seed today. Amen? The world still needs to hear the Word. Plain and simple. Jesus is still seeking and saving that which is lost. That hasn't stopped yet. Amen? But there is a day coming very soon when that last kernel of good seed is sown. So here's a question. What do you do after the crop produces its fruit? Right? You plant a field. You plowed it, you planted it, you watered it, you cultivated it, and now the crop is fully grown and it's produced fruit. What do you do now? It's what? Harvest time, right? It's time to harvest the crop. And Jesus makes it very clear here. He said the harvest is the end of the age. What age? He's talking about the church age. He's talking about the age of grace. Harvest time is the end of the church age. It's the end of the age of His grace. Listen, today, God is still offering His grace through Jesus Christ to those who want it. Amen? And we need to praise Him for that. But we also need to understand that the Bible is very clear. That the sun is setting on that grace. The darkness of His judgment is knocking at the door. Amen? At the end of the church age, when that last kernel of seed is received, and that last seed, that last soul, is saved, God will send an angel to reap the harvest. Look at verse 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Bible makes it very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ will gather together and He will judge all of those who have rejected Him as Lord and Savior. He will send His angels to reap the harvest, gather out all those who offended, all those who mocked and doubted His word, all those who mocked and ridiculed His people, all those who caused division in his church. All those who faked being a Christian. All those who were counterfeit Christians. All those who were false prophets. He will gather them together. He will judge them. And the Bible makes it very clear that he will cast them into the flames of hell. Plain and simple. The Bible tells us that vengeance is of the Lord. Now, we also need to understand that's one side of this parable. You see, the other side, you know, that's the human nature side. We like to look at the negative, right? But I also want to see the positive. Jesus gave us this parable to encourage us. You say, preacher, you haven't said much lately that encouraged us, but listen. He wants our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, and our spiritual heart to be open to truth. We need to understand that as we see this parable unfold before our eyes, we're well aware of terrors in the church, amen? We've seen it, we've experienced it. What we need to understand is all that is saying is that all things are exactly as Jesus said they would be 2,000 years ago, amen? And that needs to be encouragement to us. Jesus was not surprised by it. He wasn't surprised by, by today's falling away, so neither should we. He told us it was going to happen. 
Amen. That needs to be encouragement. That needs to let us know that the Bible is 100% true. 2,000 years ago, he said this, was ha this would happen, and it's happening right before our eyes. That needs to be an encouragement for us. We need to recognize for what it means. It means that Jesus is coming, and he's coming very soon. Amen. Verse 42, for us, or for the unsaved. He will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But here's the good news. For the saved. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he's not talking about these two things on the side of our head, is he? He's not talking about physical ears here. He's talking about spiritual ears. He's talking about those who have a true desire to want to know truth. That's why he spoke in parables. They are hidden from those who don't want to know truth, from the counterfeit Christians, from those who just want to cause division in the church. It's concealed. But to those who have ears, let them hear. He's talking about spiritual ears. He's revealing the truths of his kingdom. He's revealing the spiritual truths of his word. And he said the wheat, the righteous, they will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Amen. Amen. 